Let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 15. Today I want to go through Acts chapter 15 in its entirety. Thematically, there's only two things really to look at in great detail. And then next Sunday, I would like to go through the book of Galatians with you in one Sunday uh, as a quick overview of the book of Galatians. Then I'll be out of town for a Sunday on Labor Day weekend. Uh, That means you all come and have more fun than when I'm here. And then the following Sunday, I want to um, kind of do a part three on the subject of antinomianism. Uh, And I talked a little bit about this, I think, on a Wednesday night. Uh, I'm not sure I touched down on it on a Sunday. But I prepared a PowerPoint presentation on the subject, and I delivered that in Longmont when we were there whenever it was, June, I think. And um, uh, you guys haven't had an opportunity to go through that PowerPoint with me, which included all the scriptures and the notes and everything. And so I think that'll be helpful to you in relationship to the topic that we're looking at here in um, Acts chapter 15. And so let's begin. A certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren... Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so this is going to be a pivotal part of the development and transition uh, of what is known in dispensational theology of into the doctrines of the church age. In the old covenant dispensation, of course, circumcision was the sign of the covenant And included in circumcision were all the rest of the uh, attributes of the law of Moses, the civil law, the ceremonial law, and the moral law. And all of these things that were associated with Judaism and were the law of Moses that was part of the old covenant dispensation has been annulled in Christ. Now, don't freak out. Stay with me for the next three or four weeks before you leave the church. And at least hear, hear, hear the argument. And um, uh, because, it, it, of course, it will be very important to your doctrine. Um, and, and now what we have in this chapter is men who are believers in Jesus as Messiah, or Yeshua Mashiach, who are born again. And yet, because of their Jewish background and because of their unwillingness to understand that the law has been abolished in Christ, are carrying forward into the church age the doctrines of the Judaism and the law of Moses in an effort to tell people, now in particular Gentiles, that they must keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Well, this is a big problem, a very big problem. Um, It it has to do with, and I'll talk about this a little bit more next week, what I call front-loading and back-loading the gospel. Front-loading the gospel is whenever you put any kind of requirement as a prerequisite to faith so that you can be saved. Uh, And so if you have to, for example, repent of all of your sins before you believe, then that's front-loading. And the truth of the matter is, as much as we call people to repentance and to repent from sin, none of you in this room have come to a place where you live sinless. And so you may go through what you have as a mental exercise of repentance from sin generally, but the repentance from sins, plural, uh, you haven't done it. Uh, Even if you feel badly about it, you've had a change of mind about it, but there's still a lack of follow through. Any way you package that, any of these kind of prerequisites that say you have to do this, this, and this, and then believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, that's front-loading the gospel. We'll talk about it. Back-loading the gospel is when you say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved if you do these things following. Uh, For example, you have to be baptized in water to be saved. If somebody teaches that, that's a false doctrine. We could go on and on. Communion and... and, uh, Uh, just a continuation of certain behaviors or the cutting off of other certain behaviors. That's backloading the gospel. We believe in the gospel of grace that is taught to us in the scriptures, clearly taught to us in the scriptures by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, apart from works, period. 
And so all the rest, we do. We want people to be baptized. We want people to be obedient. We enjoy gathering around the Lord's table. All those things are things that we do as Christians, participating with the family of God, participating in the things of God, uh, but not as requirements for salvation. Our salvation is all of God and not of man. It is no part your participation. It is God's work in you, for you, through you, by faith alone in Christ alone. And so we'll hit that hard the next several weeks in a row. Uh, This is very offensive to many people. And the reason that it is offensive to many people is because certain men, underline that in your Bible, come down to us. People come in amongst us. They raise up around us certain men, as as was the case here, well-meaning men, believing men. These guys were saved. These, These were Pharisees. Uh, that were believers in Jesus as Messiah, and still they don't understand the dispensational change and therefore adding to the gospel. And uh, big, big problems here. We'll get into it even more so next week. And so certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So this case backloading. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Now, I'll come back to this in the points, but this would be one of your points. When in um, decision mode, when in uh, uh, points of dissension or when there's contention, you go to the Lord but you go to the elders. And this is very clearly spelled out here. Even Paul the apostle to the Gentiles, and we put him at such a high watermark, in this case goes under the direction of the other leadership in Antioch, Syria, where he was, where they had returned from their first missionary journey. And because there is so much tension around this, and everyone's trying to figure out what's right, what's wrong, what do we need to do, They said, look, why don't we send you guys and a delegation with you to go to Jerusalem uh, to meet with the church council, if you will. In this case, presiding over the church council is James, the brother of Jesus. Peter is there. Paul is there. Barnabas is there. There are many others. You'll see that as it comes up. This is very important in the structure, in the leadership style of churching, uh, that we understand God uses the elders Uh, as he anoints them to do the things that they're called to do. Now, being sent on their way, verse 3, by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the people. Of course, this tells you a little bit about how they went down from Syria to Jerusalem. You notice in verse 2, it says they went up to Jerusalem, I skipped that. I'd probably just comment out quickly uh, for time. In the Bible, you always go up to Jerusalem. doesn't matter where you are. And uh, you go down from Jerusalem. doesn't matter where you go. If you're going north, you're still going down if you're leaving Jerusalem. That's the way the Bible language. You're always going up to Jerusalem. And so they caused great joy with all the brethren as they were hearing the reports of all the things that God was doing, especially in this case among the Gentile believers. Again, part of the transition that's taking place Uh, where God had a covenant with Israel. Uh, He has not forsaken his covenant with Israel, but still nonetheless now is opening a door of opportunity for Gentiles to come to faith in the Jewish Messiah and be grafted into the root and fatness, the promises that God made Israel, uh, Romans 11. So when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, underline that. Now, that's a study all by itself because they make a distinction between the apostles, which you remember would be the original 11 uh, remaining, and then the elders. So there's others that have been raised up into authority, into places of decision-making and and leadership. And so all the church got together and they listened to this discussion and they're trying to come up with a decision about the doctrine and how important this doctrine might be. And they reported all that God had done with them Uh, there in Jerusalem once they got to that location. Now, some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, underline that, the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them 
and so that you don't misunderstand where they're going and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So now we're talking about dietary law, sacrificial law, ceremonial law, you name it. They, these guys are going through every nuance of the, the law of Moses, 613 laws plus all the written and oral traditions associated with each one. And so, man, there is just no way. And all these Gentiles, they haven't been brought up in all this. I mean, you're going to burden them, and you'll see that. Uh, I, I remember when we taught the book of Leviticus on when, uh, Wednesday nights some time ago, I had printed all the 613 laws and put in a binder. And it was just a big, thick stack of stuff. Just the 613 laws without all the comments and nuances. And I said, now, if you're going to come to faith in Christ here, you got to have to do all this. Is that, is, how does that work for you? You know what I mean? Uh, it's burdensome. It was taxing. That was its intended purpose, to, to make people realize, man, I can't do this. And that was the purpose of the law, to make you realize you can't do it. Therefore, you say to God, God, I can't do it. And he goes, good. That's what I wanted from you. Now, trust me, I'll take care of all the business. Amen? Okay, that was 50%. But we'll keep on. Now, the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. They were thoughtful about it. They, they didn't just blow out uh, a decision. They actually went to the Lord. They, they listened to counsel uh, because this is transition for them. They don't know what's going on either. They're trying to figure it all out. Uh, now, Paul and Peter and the others have had some experiences, and you'll see that. So when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up. And said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. Now, you remember the house of Cornelius and when Peter went there and they, they had been prepared by the Lord, called for Peter uh, Peter was prepared, Cornelius and his household was prepared, and as he was still speaking to them, the Holy Spirit fell on them, and they all began to speak in an unknown language, an, a language unknown to them, and uh, it was a manifestation of the power and presence of God that was infilling them and baptizing them into the body of Christ. And so a visible manifestation took place, which was stunning to everyone. What in the world's going on? Even these Gentiles are now being born again. They're being regenerated by the Holy Spirit that is coming into them. And uh, this was stunning to watch, uh, to observe. And so Peter testifies to this. And God made no distinction, verse 9, between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So, look, we couldn't keep up with the 613 laws and the nuances. Now you're going to put this on them? Why, are we, why would you do that? God is saving them the same way uh, that he is saving us, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Well, then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders. So the testimony of Peter is over. Now it's Paul and Barnabas. And they declared how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. Now remember, in this case, uh, not all the occasions involved speaking in tongues. There was, in this case, uh, miracles, healings that took place. Remember, uh, the guys that couldn't walk. Uh, and they were miraculously healed. I mean, these, these signs, these wonders, they were even raising Paul from what appeared to be death when they were, uh, Paul got stoned in Lystra. Remember that quote? Uh, never mind. Uh, and so uh, yeah, some of you will get that later. And uh, uh, he, they drag him out of the city, and they, they think, man, the guy's dead, and the next day he's walking around in the city, you know. And uh, it's, it's amazing, the miracles that took place. And so all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James. Now, so Peter testifies, Barnabas and Paul testify, 
And now James, uh, who's presiding as the uh, chairman of the board, if you will, uh, is going to make a decision. Now, this is not James the disciple. This is James the brother of Jesus, who did not even respond to Jesus as Messiah until after the resurrection. Uh, why do we know that? Well, we know the other James had been killed earlier uh, in our storyline. Uh, back a couple of chapters, it was Herod uh, uh, killed James because he was making the, all the, the Jews happy. Chapter 12, verse 1. And so uh, James, the brother of Jesus, who's presiding at this meeting as the chairman, so to speak, uh, after everyone is silent, James answers and says, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon, uh, uh, that is Peter, but Simon Peter, has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, the house of Cornelius. And with this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, info on the backstory here, but let's read through it first, uh, 16 and 17. After this, I will return... And I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebu rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. And so he pulls from the context of the book of Amos these words, and it really doesn't relate to the church age. Remember here, now in the, in the uh, Greek version, New Testament, it says, after this, I will return. So after what? Well, this is disputed because of the omission and addition in the Hebrew versus the Greek. But the point is that there is something going to take place before this occurs. And this is true in the mind of James. Uh, who obviously had a good dispensational model. Uh, we are presently in the church age, the blue half circle. The next major prophetic event will be the rapture of the church. Then you've got the tribulation period, which is going to be a seven-year period of history. Uh, then the second coming of Christ, when God makes himself known to Israel. Uh, these these uh, major prophetic uh, judgments are pictured by the flames, if you're not familiar with our bookmark. Uh, and then you have the millennial reign of Christ, the millennial kingdom. And it is, it is going to be during the millennial kingdom that this verse will come to its fruition. And so it, it's not really related to the church age at all. And so I point this out to you to just indicate a, a specific word that's vital to the text. In this verse 15, and with this the words of the prophets agree. So he's not using eisegesis, taking something out of text and placing it into an argument to make his argument what he wants it to be. Uh, he is just simply using in the homily, the, the, the sermon that he's delivering, that he, uh, this is an agreement, that God does have a plan for the Gentiles. And look, even in this case, now there is a day coming when the Lord will sit on the throne of David uh, he will reign from Jerusalem. All the Gentiles shall flow to Jerusalem and so forth. Again, we're not talking about all the eschatology, study of the end times uh, today. And so he says, look, these words agree that the Gentiles will be saved. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord. Verse 17. Then verse 18. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Now, this is not a surprise to God. God had planned for this, and that's identified even in the Amos passage. So uh, again, we could talk a bit about the sovereignty of God. We can talk about the foreknowledge of God. We can talk about predestination, uh, all of these things. And by the way, just in brief, um, you cannot ever assume God doesn't know something. God doesn't learn, and he never tricks himself into not knowing. And so predestination and foreknowledge are always linked together. You cannot divorce the two, uh, especially for those of you that might be wrestling with the whole concept of predestination. Well, known to God 
from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them, now these, this list of things, to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues of the Jews. And again, much to cover here, and I realize I'm going quickly. First thing I want to point out here is that what James is saying in verse 20, we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled and from blood, are non-salvific. So they are not things that are required for salvation. Salvific meaning, in this context, salvation. Okay, so the front-loading, back-loading would have just happened again if James had said, okay, they can believe, but they have to do this. That is not what's being said here. So this is not salvific. This is practical. This is an outworking of, of their uh, practice as Christians. That's part one. Part two, uh, why? It tells us in verse 21, Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues of the Jews. So in other words, all the culture would understand this. And it would be offensive to some to see this kind of activity, especially to the Jews, to see this kind of activity. So, that you, you know, you're going to break out your blood sausage in front of your buddies. You know, no, you're not going to do that. You're not going to eat things strangled. There's not going to be any idolatry. You're going to separate yourself from idolatry and idol worship, sacrificing to idols, even things eating, uh, eating things sacrificed to idols uh, in this context. And um, from immorality. And so, you know, sexual promiscuity, divorce, uh, remarriage, adultery, fornication, etc. Uh, homosexuality, bestiality, all of them included in the term immorality. And so he's saying, look, this is the way we want to get you a start uh, on your practice, orthopraxy. Uh, our, we're dealing with the orthodoxy, the doctrine. Now we're dealing with your orthopraxy. And we want you to be living uh, in this way. And why? So that you're not a stumbling block to somebody else. Okay? Now, point number three. This is important to you. I've told you this before. And you uh, love reminders. And so I love to remind you. Uh, Again, I have no idea what I'm doing here today. I should have, I've stayed home. I don't know. Um, the book of Acts is a transitional book. The book of Acts is a history book. So the things that are being communicated to you are accurate history that are part of a transition that record the absolute truth of the conversation but not necessarily the absolute truth. Swallow hard. Not everything they did in the book of Acts is what we're supposed to do. Not everything they said in the book of Acts is doctrine. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let's, let me illustrate, because I could tell I lost about half the church. Um, well, no, that was, that's, a, that's an understatement. I lost about 90% of the... No, I, I'm going to restate that. I lost about 99%. No. Okay, look. Remember when uh, uh, they cast lots to choose Matthias? That's what they did. Is that what we're supposed to do today? No. That's not, we're not being taught to do that. Remember they sold everything they had and they brought all the money and laid it at the apostles' feet? That's what they did, but that's not what we're being instructed to do. Now, in this case, you have an accurate conversation 
that is being given, it is accurately portrayed, it's being communicated to you about the things that James said, let's tell these already saved people, not how to be saved, not how to keep themselves saved, but what they should do in practice now that they are saved. And this was the list. Now that doesn't mean it's all the list, nor does it mean that that list stays in effect. Why do I say that? Because in the transitional process of God making himself known through the epistles in what we call progressive revelation, the growing knowledge of the things of God, later, Paul the apostle even says, an idol is nothing. It doesn't matter if you eat food offered to an idol. And so if you, in this context, say abstain from those things offered to idols or abstain from idolatry or those things that are polluted by idols... That would have been the teaching of the church. You cannot ever eat anything sacrificed to an idol. But Paul tells the Corinthians later, an idol is nothing, it doesn't matter. If you eat it, doesn't matter. If you don't eat it, doesn't matter. But if you don't eat it, don't eat it, not for your own sake so that you might be more righteous. Don't eat it for the sake of somebody else that might be stumbled by seeing you eat it. Are you guys familiar with all that? Yep. See, I realize, again, I go, I'm going through this chapter and I realize I could spend a year in this chapter. And I've kind of committed, as you know, to get through the book of Acts in a year rather than in 10 years, uh, mainly because uh, I would like to at least get through the rest of the New Testament and, and to finally uh, at least get to the book of Revelation uh, at least one more time before I'm dead. And so that's the, that's the plan, you know. So by the time I start Revelation chapter one, start planning for whatever's next, right? Uh, yeah. Hopefully not. Hopefully we'll be here a long, long, long time. And so I want to make sure you understand that the book of Acts is transitional. The book of Acts is historical. The book of Acts is accurate. It is verbally inspired. It's authoritative. But not everything they did in the book of Acts is church age doctrine. Do you understand that? Okay, good. Yes. Cheers to me on that. Oh, do you got, I digress. Do you know why this stuff matters to me? Because I love you. It's the truth. I love you guys. I want you to know the truth. I want you to be able to defend the truth. I, I strive over this or I will labor over this stuff because it is so important, especially now in the times in which we live. And so Moses has throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues of the Jews. Well, it pleased the apostles and elders and the whole church and they sent chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who is also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. First mention of Silas. Paul and Silas do some work together down the road. So now you had a delegation of people that came from Antioch to Jerusalem. Now they've heard the testimonies. They've made a decision. They prayed about it. They, they came up with what they thought was the right thing to do. And now not only did they send back the entire delegation to, uh, to Assyria, uh, to uh, Syria. Uh, the city of Antioch in Syria, but also a delegation of people from Jerusalem. So you don't have any one guy's opinion. Nope, that's the way it happened. You know, some guy comes in and says, well, here's the way it went down, and uh, he's the only one to testify to it. No, they have a whole mass of people that are traveling back and forth to give the credibility and substantial uh, information that is necessary to keep a solid doctrine. So verse 23, they write a letter. And in this letter, it says this, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Galatia, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, Cilic excuse me, Cilicia, I apologize. I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm looking at the time. I have lots of time still, but I got lots to say. And so, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Notice the omission of Galatia. I'll only mention that now, but that will come up next week because Paul writes the letter to the Galatians. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us, from Jerusalem, 
have troubled you with words unsettling your souls, discouraging you, making you confused, making you insecure, and saying, you must be circumcised, underline it, and keep the law. <laughs> Man, I wish that we could get this message through to a lot of people. Uh, you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. We never told them to say that. These are just certain men from among us that went out on their own to do their own thing. And guys, if we don't have that problem today, I don't know what problem we've got. Everybody running around doing their own thing. And, uh, oh, it's causing a lot of trouble. I could illustrate all day long. Well, it seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. This tells you that the, the Lord was prophetically working with them, giving them word of knowledge, word of prophecy, a word of wisdom, that they are listening to the Lord. They were praying and seeking the counsel of the Lord, not just the counsel of men. And it seemed to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. End of subject. So this is the list that we've come up with for you now that you're saved, not so that you can be saved, not so that you can stay saved, but as a part of your testimony, this is the way we want you to live. So farewell. They direct them in doctrine. They direct them in practice. They direct them in love, love for others in their testimony. Verse 30, so when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. So it's, they're, they're settled. Now, again, keep in mind how much time has gone by. This is quite a journey from Antioch, Syria, all the way to Jerusalem to have the meeting. We, the meeting, I'm sure, didn't happen over a day. It was probably a lengthy period of time, some coming and going, and then the journey back. We're talking about a lengthy period of time where people are being troubled by these Judaizers, they call them. Uh, we call them the Judaizers. And when they had read uh, the letter, they, were rejo they rejoiced over it in, in its encouragement. Now Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. So again, prophetic utterances taking place, spiritual activity of the Holy Spirit, part of the church age. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However... It seemed good to Silas to remain there. So they said, man, thanks for coming. Uh, this has been exciting to hear from you guys. Uh, now go back and tell everybody that we've received it. Well, everybody goes back except for Silas. He goes, man, I think I'm going to stay here. I like what's going on here, and I'm going I'm to be a part of this. So Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And so that ends that portion. Now, I'm going to continue because I want to finish this chapter lest I uh, get uh, five or six weeks away from it to come back here. So after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. So now they're going to go back through Cilicia and up into Galatia and revisit all those churches that they had planted, that people were saved, uh, that are also very, very negatively being affected by uh, the Judaizers, which we'll talk about next Sunday in the book of Galatians. Well, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. Underline in your Bible the word determined. But Paul insisted, underline the word insisted, now you got one guy that's determined and another guy that's insisted, <laughs> that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them in the work. So now Paul and Barnabas are having a dispute between the two of them. And so 
Barnabas says, look, I'm taking my cousin or my nephew. I think it was his, I think it was his nephew. I can't remember. And uh, he says, I'm taking him with us. And Paul says, no. Remember, he was with us on our first missionary journey. And uh, he abandoned ship, so to speak. And nope, he's not going. And Barnabas says, yes, he is. And Paul says, no, he's not. And they were not able to come up with a solution. And verse 39 says, then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being commend, commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. That is Paul. So we have Barnabas, who goes back to his home island, Cyprus, his hometown, takes Mark with him. He established a tremendous, we know this in history, a tremendous work for God on the island of Cyprus as an apostle slash pastor and a son of encouragement to Mark. Remember, Barnabas means son of encouragement. And so he was very focused on Mark and how things would affect Mark. Paul said, no, I'm very focused on the rest of the world, on the missionary journey. I don't want to be bogged down with a guy that I can't trust. And so I've got a, a world vision, and the other one's got a personal vision. Uh, differences of opinion. And so they could not come up with a solution otherwise, and they, there was a division. Now, let's go to my points, and I have five minutes to go through what I could use as an entire sermon of its own, uh, as always is the case. Number one, there will always be, and you'll have to get these later, sorry, if you're, if you're going to try to write them down, uh, you'll have to uh, either write fast or uh, listen to the tape. The tape. There, <laughs> there will always be certain men in the church age who promote false doctrine. There will always be certain men. Uh, this is this is so typical. Uh, in fact, one of the problems of the church age is the problem of doctrine. Uh, and in each dispensation, there is a responsibility, a failure, and a discipline. The responsibility in the church age, believe it or not, is doctrine. And guys, this is the most unpopular word in the church. We must earnestly contend for the faith. Do you know what would have happened if this argument didn't take place? Do you know if they would have said, well, it just doesn't matter. Let's not, let's not divide over you know, circumcision. Pretty soon you would have had a, a cultic church because everyone there would have had to have been circumcised in order to be saved, and they would have been preaching a false gospel. If this had not occurred, and God had not otherwise intervened, the whole doctrine of the church age would have been corrupted in the first century, and all of us would be under the influences of a doctrine that was not from the Lord. This is absolutely critical. These guys said, in order to be saved, you must be circumcised, and keep the law. No. By faith alone, through Christ alone, because of his grace alone. So, number two, God can and does use division. In this chapter, we saw two different kinds of division. We saw the division with the Judaizers and those that were contending for the faith, and you saw the division between Paul and Barnabas uh, related to Mark. And so God can and does use division. I, I put this into subpoints. Uh, point A. He does and use division sometimes to make known those who are approved in ministry. Uh, Paul says there are divisions among you, and I accept it. Or I, I see it. I understand it. So that those who are approved may be manifest among you. Another way of saying that is to so that you would know who are disapproved. Okay. And so God uses division to show truth and error. In fact, under the law in the Old Covenant, Old Testament times, the law of uh, the, the, the food, dietary laws, the main reason wasn't because of health things. Uh, it was because God said, and it says this right in the book of Leviticus, that you may learn to discern between good and evil. So he uses it as an illustration to teach them to think and to know right and wrong and, and to make decisions. It wasn't about whether or not it's okay to eat a piece of crab or a piece of pork versus a piece of ox, okay? 
there's things that we can talk about related to that, but that's uh, not the primary reason. The primary reason is spelled out for you in the Bible, that you may know how to discern. God wants you to be thinking. Number two, or item B in, in uh, point two, to define doctrine. So God does and can use, uh, can and does use division to define doctrine. And this means that we have to become decisive and know how to discern between good and evil, but we have to be decisive. We can't be flimsy. It doesn't matter what you believe. We all, you know, just we all love Jesus and that's all that matters. I don't know how many times I've heard that kind of sentence. You know, listen, there's more than just saying, I believe in Jesus. What Jesus are we talking about? What about the gospel? What gospel are we talking about? Again, I don't have time to develop all this today, uh, but these are critical, critical items. God can and does use division part C to allow for differing styles of leadership. So it's not always negative. Did you hear me? It's not always negative. God uses division at times to allow for different styles of leadership. Paul had one focus. His was going out to all the world. Barnabas had a focus on Mark. This, this, I wish I had time to develop for you because I've seen it over and over again. Now, I've subpointed again from my subpoints. These are Roman numeral one and two. Roman numeral one is God used Barnabas, the son of encouragement, to minister as a pastor to Mark and to establish the church in Cyprus. God did a great thing through Barnabas, okay? And so that was a one style of leadership. Uh, Barnabas was super focused on one person. Number, item, Roman numeral two, God used Paul as an apostolic missionary and church planter. And so Paul's focus was different. He wasn't staying in Antioch. He wasn't going to stay in Corinth. He wasn't going to stay in Ephesus. He was going to move himself through from Berea and Thessalonica and all the different places that he went to, got people saved, and got them started and took off. He appointed elders in every city and allowed those people to oversee and to become the pastors of the local churches. God used both kinds of ministry, and we need to know that that is what occurred. Now, it doesn't discount that those that are disapproved might be made manifest. Sometimes the division is so that God will show what is right and wrong. But other times there is a right kind of division. We just don't see this the same way. And so I want you to be able to be generous and gracious uh, when we do see different styles of leadership in the churches. We're not the only church. We're not the only right church. If, if, if candlelight starts becoming the only right church, we're a cult. Okay? Let's, let's keep that in mind. Does everybody understand that? Okay, I'm moving quickly. Number three and last We see how the early church used church leadership and as they sought the counsel of the Lord and the elders. So we see that God has a structure. I talked about this the other day about the organized church, the institutional church. And in this case, when the people became troubled, they went to the elders. They went to the apostles. They talked about it. One of the things that bothers me most of all is when people decide to just take off and never even ask questions. Or if they have some kind of funny idea about doctrine, they never come and submit those doctrines to the elders. The elders are not given an opportunity oftentimes with people to say, look, let's talk through your doctrine and see to it that it is, in fact, correct. But instead, with the looseness and the lackadaisical approach to our ecclesiology today, we have people that are now certain men that are running off doing their own thing and causing untold trouble. And it is unbiblical. It is not what God intended. He wants us to contend earnestly for the faith. He wants us to understand church management. He wants us to understand leadership. He wants us to understand submission to leadership and foremost, submission to the written word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.